morning, everybody. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, brother. Well, I'm going to ask that you'd also bow your heads with me because uh, I really want the Lord to speak through his word, and I don't want to get in the way, so if you could please bow. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Lord, may the meditations of my heart, may the words of my mouth be pleasing to you. Lord, may we, your church, your followers here this morning, may we listen intently to your word. Lord, may I get out of the way and, and, and just only do and say what you want me to say. Lord, I pray that we would be so encouraged by your truth that we would worship you in, in, in majesty and in splendor. Lord, encourage our hearts, teach us, instruct us this morning for your glory. It's in your name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, I want to start by asking for your patience this morning because um, this, this, could, this could be a, another series. <laughs> and, and I'm really, I'm asking for the Lord to restrain, uh, to give me restraint so that I can, uh, I can just do whatever he wants. And, but I want, there's, there's a lot of scripture here this morning, a lot, a lot, a lot. So if you're a note taker, um, I'll say God bless you. If it, <laughs> and if, uh, if you're not, I, I, would, I would encourage you, ask the Lord to teach you and to have whatever points, whatever scripture stick that you're, that's for you, that the Spirit is teaching you. And, um, and so, yeah, if I talk faster, uh, forgive me. If I talk slower, forgive me. But I really do want to honor the Lord with our, with our time today during this, this sermon. Um, for those of you who weren't here last week, we, we did do this one uh, particular sermon on what is the role of the government. And, and we asked the question, what is God's intended design for human government? So I'm going to quickly, as quickly as I can, kind of recap last week, because last week becomes the jumping off point for this week. It, it naturally flows into what we want to talk about next. So if you already have uh, notes from last week, or if you haven't seen it, you can watch the, the sermon online on our YouTube, but I just want to remind us of these things. So what is God's intention? What's his intended design for human government? We, we talked about this first absolutely uh, primary principle, it's that God is king. God is a king, and he has ordained human government for his glory. Because God is king, he governs as king, and he sets up rulers, and those rulers are supposed to reflect him. But uh, Psalm 47 shows about God being king. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises for God is king of all the earth. There isn't one place on earth or one person on earth who has ever lived on this earth who hasn't been under the kingship of God. God is comprehensive king, and all of uh, his, his kingliness and all the kingdoms that he sets up are ultimately for his glory. Uh, 1 Peter 2 says, be subject, it's going to say, to the human governments, to the human institution. Why? For the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake, we're supposed to submit to the government and submit to the different things, to the different uh, authorities. And so that really, then, is the starting point. God is king over everyone, everywhere, at all times, and anything he sets up on earth through humans created is for his glory. And so by that very nature, we talked about how Jesus, in this, in this um, interaction point between the, the Pharisees and the scribes who were, trying to, who were trying to trick him, 
he actually reveals something very important about government, and it's that government is actually, by God's design, limited. Government is limited uh, because when Jesus was trying to be tricked about whether or not he should pay taxes, Jesus said, whose likeness and in inscription is on this coin? And they said, it's Caesar's. He said, okay, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but to God the things that are God's. And in this section, we clearly see Jesus says, yes, Caesar or government has a real legitimate authority and do. We owe them things like taxes. That's legitimate. But they don't have full comprehensive authority over all parts of life. They have a lane by which they are to stay in. They have a domain. They have a jurisdiction. Just remember, it's underneath God. God, has, is, God owns everything and governs everything. And so by the very nature, God creates government to be limited. And we see that that's not just true for human government. That's true for other things he designed. Like he designed the human conscience. Did you know that? He gave every single person a conscience. And that is a very particular uh, jurisdiction. It's called that person's conscience is only to be binding on that person. That has a, that has a jurisdiction. A person of one. And it goes from the individual to the family. Within the family, God created fathers to be the heads of households, and they have jurisdiction over their family, but they don't have jurisdiction over other families. So they have a limited role in which they're supposed to govern. And the church, the church has uh, elders, and they, have, uh, they rule, and they, they lead, and the church is here for worship and for the proclamation of the gospel and for the discipling of the nations. And we have a lane, and we, we can rule over the congregation of the church, but we're not ruling over every single congregation. We're not ruling over every single Christian. We have lanes by which we stay in, and the government has a lane as well. They do rule over society, but not all of society. They rule over society in a particular way. So let me just remind us of these three main ways that God set up the intention for, God, for government. It's this. It's that God des uh, designed government to punish evildoers. He designed government to praise good conduct and to protect societal peace, to punish evildoers, to praise good conduct, and to protect societal peace. And so I'll, just, I'll read uh, from Romans 13, just, just a few verses from it. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, uh, but to bad. Would you have fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, if you... And for he does not bear the sword in vain. You know, God sets up all of these governments in the world, and he gives all of these governments purposes, and he gives them tools. Actually, if we think about the four different governments I talked about, the, the conscience, the family, the church, and, the, and the, the society, they all have tools. Did you know that the tool of to restrain evil, that's, the, that's, the, the, that's how God set this up. God gave these different jurisdictions to restrain evil. And so the conscience, God gives the tool of guilt. Did you know that? That God uses guilt to restrain evil in the conscience. That's what he does. Your conscience bears you witness, and it, it is defiled, and, and, and it is weak, and it, because it gives you guilt, and you go, oh, I shouldn't do that. That's actually a limiter to evil. That's a good thing. God gives the tool of guilt. In the family, God gives fathers the rod of discipline. That's the home, and that's to restrain evil. It says, do not withhold discipline from a child, right? Um, that's that's the, the tool of, to restrain evil in the home. In the church, it's church discipline. It's, it's calling people to a life of holiness and righteousness, and when they don't, it's, it's, it's calling for their public repentance or their pr first private repentance, then if they continue in their sin, public repentance, and then if, they, if it goes that far, then the removal of the church. That's a, that's a tool that God has given the church to be able to restrain evil, church, church discipline. And then in the government, he gives the government the sword to restrain evil. And the sword is what it sounds like. He has given the government the capacity to kill people, to, to actually murder them, but not for no reason. <laughs> the reason why God would give the government the ability to do that is because God is avenging some murder. Literally, if you even, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 9. After God 
uh, destroyed the world with a flood, he immediately sets up with Noah, this Noahic covenant, and he says, hey, be fruitful, multiply, you know, fill the earth. He kind of says similar things to Adam. But then in the midst of this fallen world, he immediately says, and if anybody sheds blood or takes the life of another, you take that person's life. God immediately sets up human government and the, the power of the sword to restrain evil. To restrain evil. Because if you shed blood, your blood shall be shed. And so some people think, oh, that's a, you know, God's a murdering God. No, no, no. People are murderers. People are murderers. And God is righteously enacting judgment on the murderer through the government. So that is a restraining, uh, it's, a, it's a restraining grace. It's God's grace that he would do that. It just shows you that we are sinful people. And uh, we go, we need restraint. But uh, just sort of wrapping this up, government is meant to respond to evil doing, not compel our good. Meaning they're not, they should not force us to do good. They should encourage us to follow God and do his good and to praise whatever we do as good and to protect the society so that we can live peaceably. And I just want to read from 1 Timothy, uh, again, to remind us that when, they, when we pray for them, um, we were praying that they would protect the peace so that we can live this way. First Timothy 2. For first of all then, uh, I urge, I urge, strongly urge that, that supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people and for kings and for all those in high positions that we, not the kings, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life and godly and dignified in every way. Verse 3. This is good and pleasing in the sight of our God who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. There's only one God, and he rules everything, everyone, everywhere, and he uses God-designed, ordained government to actually create peaceable situations so that people can find him. It's a very good design. And so what do we owe the government? We owe them subjection, where we submit ourselves to them and their God-given rule. We owe them the taxes, um, revenue. Revenue is just another way of saying fees, like customs, tolls, like, hey, stuff... Stuff costs. Um, if, it, if, it, if, it, if there's a charge for that, pay it. You know, pay the fee. Um, we, but we also not only just owe them, say, money, but we, we, we owe them respect. We owe them honor. Um, and that's, that would be true of anybody. We would owe anybody respect, anybody honor. We owe everybody honor because they're, everybody's, these people are made in the image of God. So, so then we ended by saying, what should we do? We should praise the Lord for this good design. We should pray for our, our government to, to do their job God's way, excuse me, and to participate in all the good works that we're supposed to be doing, not, not every good work out there, just all the good works that God has given us to do that he's prepared for us ahead of time as it relates to our neighbor and as it relates to encouraging our government and participating in the government society around us. So that leads us to our point today. That was yesterday, that was last week. But many of you may, may be asking a question has that government that you just described ever existed anywhere on earth? <laughs> I mean it. Did what I just described ring true to you? Oh, yeah, that, that happens perfectly down the street or in our country or in another country. Or I remember this one time in history when, it was, when this was happening just like God said. Um, I, I, I don't think it's that big of a stretch to be able to say, I don't know if this has ever been righteously carried out anywhere by anyone. This is talking about God's design. And if you think about it, there's lots of things that God has designed that nobody has carried out. I mean, ever since the fall, absolutely everything of God's, has there ever been somebody who's righteously followed God according to their conscience the whole time? Has there any been any family that's rightfully and righteously lived by the, the perfect law of God and the jurisdiction by which the family is supposed to live? Is there no, do you know anybody who has a perfect family? If you know any church, do you know any church that's perfectly doing everything right and, and, and living under, to the fullest of the design of God? Well, we live in a fallen world. And so this then naturally follows, well, okay, that's a great design. I love that. That's so beautiful. I'm waiting to, I'm waiting to see that. I'm waiting to experience that. I want to participate in that because that sounds awesome. But where is that? And the answer is it's, it's, it's not on earth here. God's perfect government is happening in heaven right now, in Christ and his angels. 
And right now, the, the reign of Christ in heaven is perfect reign, and the, the unrighteous reign of, of kings and rulers on earth is, they are separated in the sense that there are people on earth right now who you know and who, whom I know, who we're a part of this wicked system. It's broken. It needs, it's not perfect. So, so and, and is that okay? Is that good? Is that, what's going on? Let me read just a few, few Proverbs here for us. Proverbs 29, verse 2 says, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. Woohoo! I love it when righteousness and righteous increase. But when wicked rule, when there are wicked people who rule wickedly, they, the people groan. I mean, this is understood that we live in a broken, fallen world. The, the Bible's just not pie in the sky saying, look how beautiful this is, and then kind of like, let's not talk about the obvious. <laughs> no, this is the Bible here. Nitty gritty Bible. Look what it says. L- this is upsetting to God. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 16. It is an abomination. That's one of the harshest words that could be used. It is an abomination to, for, for kings to do evil. For the throne is established by righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, family, friends, you may suspect this, but I want to tell you from the word of God, it is wicked. When anybody uses their authority for their own purposes and not for God's. It is wicked. And so we have then a tension here. What do we do? Because we have imperfect rulers and imperfect leaders and we're imperfect citizens. How does this work? Let me ask a question here. So the government restrains evil. That's their job, right? But what or who restrains the government? What or who restrains the government? If you think about this, um, did you know, you know, the conscience and the family and the church and and the government, they all have a lane, right? But you know that any one of these other lanes, uh, they bump into each other. You know, like when I'm driving on the, on the road, I am driving, I'm, 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 I have my own conscience and I have my own car, but I'm bumping into the jurisdiction of the government here by running on roads. And so we overlap all the time. And the question is, what do we do when people are not doing what they're supposed to do? Actually, the way God sets it up is these other areas of God's intended jurisdiction are supposed to help the other out by pointing out to do their job. But um, we, we we're, we're going to see this, that this is a very long, uh, or I should say a very complicated and a long conversation that's been happening in history. And there's not, there's not necessarily easy answers, but, but let me give you a, a quick encouragement here. Um, we are Christians, and we are Protestant Christians, and part of being a Protestant Christian is living in, in what the Protestant Reformation came about and what it brought us. Uh, there are a couple phrases I want to bring to our mind that are specifically came out of the Protestant Reformation. One of them you've probably heard of. Another one you may, may or may not have heard of. One is sola scriptura. Sola scriptura. Maybe some of you probably, I've said this before in the past, but maybe uh, we are familiar, maybe we're less familiar with this. This has to do with, um, you know, how do we arrive at understanding scripture and what does scripture teach us? Sola scriptura says that, that the scriptures are the only and the final authority on matters on all matters of faith and practice, that the scriptures alone are the authority. And the reason why we're bringing this up is because when we're gonna talk about who should help who and who should restrain who and what that looks like, what we're really bumping up against is this idea that a lot of people have different opinions about this, right? Why do people not like to talk about politics? It's because everybody has their own idea what they think should happen. Well, what I'm I'm bringing you to, to today is to say, it ultimately doesn't matter what you and I think. It matters what God says. And it matters what God, God's verdict on this is. And so part of the Protestant Reformation is it doesn't matter what I think or what certain tradition thinks or what certain uh, uh, churches teach. It matters what the Bible says, and we need to submit ourselves to the Bible alone. The Bible is the final authority on this. And so we really need to go to the Bible. The second part is not just sola scriptura, like only the scriptures, but tota scriptura, which is this idea that uh, you don't just, it's, it's the Bible alone, but you, you don't get to pick and choose what scriptures 
make most sense to you and what scriptures you want to ignore. If you're going to derive a doctrine, if you're going to understand a matter about what the scripture says, you have to look at all the scriptures, the total of the scriptures. And, and so both of these put together really give us not only permission, but a mandate on how to think biblically and how to live biblically in this world. We must submit to the scripture as the final authority on all these issues, and we need to look at all of scripture, all of scripture, not just the ones we're aware of, not just the ones that make sense to us, tota scriptura. And so this is one of those questions that we, we need these concepts because there is not a verse that says, here's what you do when the government is not staying in their lane. Here's what you do in a fallen world in regards to the government. What we have in scripture explicitly is, is submit to the government because it's a good, God set it up and it's got a good design. So seek God's design. But it doesn't give you the gray areas. It doesn't give you the exception clauses. It doesn't give you the but, what about that? And so here's where we need sola scriptura. Don't look at, don't, don't look at what other people think. Look at what scripture says. And look at what all of scripture says. So I want to encourage you, we're going to be in a lot of scripture today because this is how we, how we do theology. As we, we look at all of the things that the scripture both prescribes, which tells us exactly to do, and describes, which shows us the example of how they did it back then. So let me give you um, the first answer of what I think can be derived from the scriptures uh, pretty clearly. The question, so the government restrains evil, but who or what restrains the government? Here's our first point. It's that God restrains government by King Jesus himself and through the law, through, through Christ's law. God restrains government by King Jesus and by his law. This is how we see governments living underneath the government of God. Proverbs 21, 1 says it clearly that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. God is sovereign over the kings of the earth to influence them and to control them and to move them whenever, wherever he wants. God is sovereign over, and I'm going to go from God to Jesus, but let's look at these all of the scriptures here. Uh, let's look at Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 23, describing what a good king looks like. It says, when one rules justly, that's good, uh, rules over men justly, ruling in the fear of God, what does it look like to rule justly on this earth? You must rule with the fear of God. You must be underneath God's authority, caring what God says about everything, it says, when that happens, he dawns, he dawns on them like the morning light and like the sun shining forth on the cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. It is a beautiful thing when kings submit to God. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, let's move directly to Jesus. So we see this in God, but let's see how Jesus does this. Colossians chapter 1, it's describing Jesus in this moment. And it says, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible, look what he says now, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, this is whether it's earthly kings and authorities or spiritual authorities like in the demonic realm, both invisible and visible, Jesus created all things, and look what it says next, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He didn't just make it, start it, and let it go. He didn't just spin it off like a top so that it could, it could run its own life. Jesus continues to hold the kings and the thrones and the authorities on earth today. Jesus is the one who is restraining evil today. Can we see this? Look at Revelation chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from him who, who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits, which is the sevenfold uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit, and who is before his throne and from who? Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth. Jesus is the ruler. Jesus is the king of kings. And so he's the one that restrains and this brings you to the text that we read this morning, Psalm 2, because it was a prophetic psalm talking about the king uh, that would come from the line of David and how the kings of the earth are plotting against God's king, 
And look at what this psalm says. Let's read it again. It's going to be ultimately talking about Jesus ruling the kings of the earth. Let's see this. It says, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. They conspire. Hello, conspiracy is in the Bible. This is a real thing, people. Um, they, cons- they, 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 they counsel together against who? Against the Lord and against his anointed. They go, and look what they say. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. These kings are saying, we don't want your rulership, God. We don't want your kingly rulership over us. We want to rule ourselves. He, he, look, look at God's response. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, meaning he mocks the mockers. He scoffs at the scoffers. When people say there is no God, I can do my own thing, don't tell me what to do, God laughs. He goes, ha, you think that's true? Ha, keep going. That's, what, that's, that's literally, I'm not exaggerating. It says, this is what the scriptures say. God laughs when humans go, I'm going to do what I want and rule the people the way I think. Then he speaks to them in his wrath and terrifies them in his fury. Let's skip, let's skip to uh, chapter 2, verse 10 and 12, because here's a clear wisdom for these kings and a warning to these kings. It says, now therefore, O kings, be wise, be wise, and be warned. You are on warning, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Who's the Son? Capitalize. The Son. The Son of God. The Son of David. The Messiah. The Anointed One. Jesus. Kiss Jesus' hand and his feet. Submit to King Jesus, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Can we see here that government does not have the ability to do whatever they want, whenever they want, to whomever they want, however they want. This is not a free-for-all, unlimited rule because here's what happens. People, in, an, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a wrong view, a truncated view of Romans 13, there are many people who just, go, who just say, look what the Bible says, submit to the, submit to the authorities, submit to the authorities. God's given it to them. It's a good thing. Submit to them. Did you know that the very same scriptures were used to justify people submitting to Hitler? The very same scripture. Hey, Hitler was a duly elected official. Therefore, he's God's official. No, human kings and rulers cannot do whatever they want. They cannot do whatever they want. And we, that goes for us too. We cannot do whatever we want. Nobody can do whatever they want. We're all called to live, uh, we're all called to die to ourselves and to live to Christ. And so here's something. We said, who's the restrainer of the government? It's King Jesus himself and his law. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 17 is, is the first five books of the, of, the, of, the, of the Bible. And it tells explicitly what it looks like for Israel to set up a king. And notice that the king was required to write his own copy of the law. Now people may are automatically going to go, oh, but that's just for Israel. That's not for everybody. Let's read this. And I'll show you what. I really think Paul had this in mind when he, was, when he was writing Romans. Deuteronomy 17. When you come into the land that your Lord God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Look at God is the one who is orchestrating how, who the king will be. That's how it's supposed to be. If you, if you skip down to verse 18... You know, it talks about, hey, you can't have too many horses, can't have too many wives, can't have too much gold, you can't be greedy. What kind of king should you have over you? And look what it says what the king must do, verse 18. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself, meaning go get it, king. This is your responsibility to get done. He shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, the law of God. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord, his God, by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes by doing them. 
that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and he may be humble, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom. It was a requirement for kings to write the law of God, to have their own handwritten copy so that they could, they could be in it every day. What do you want, God? This is your world. This is your kingdom. How do I rule your world, your kingdom, your way? This is God's design for kings. And again, for those people who say, oh, it's just for Israel. It's just talking about Israel. No, Israel was a light to the nations. Israel was meant to be a, a beacon of hope, a picture of truth, of what it looked like to submit to God. In fact, that's what happened when the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon, who heard about all the wisdom. What happened? She goes, wow, look at this crazy kingdom that you have. It's incredible. And what did she do? She gave glory to the God of Solomon. That is the design. When people do things God's way, God gets the glory. And this is the design not just for Israel. This is the design for all human kingdoms. That they would be run by God's law. In fact, some people go, oh man, really? It's not just for kings. You know, this is true for, for ev everyone, every individual person, every, every person for all time. Look at Ecclesiastes. If you know the book Ecclesiastes, it's wisdom. And he goes through all these tensions and, and, and complications of life. It's crazy. And at the very end of all the book, what does he say? He sums it all up. And he says, the end of the matter, it has all been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of just the kings when they're doing it right. This is the whole duty of man. This is the whole duty of humans. Whether you believe him or not, whether you follow him or not, it's all the same standard. It's God and his law. That is the standard by which we are all called. And God put that standard in our hearts. Romans says it really clearly. Even if you've never heard it before, God gave you a conscience and he gave you his law in his heart to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's written into the heart of every person. It says it, Romans chapter 2. It, 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 nobody's without excuse. Everybody knows that much. Everybody can see that this was a created place, and if they say it isn't, it's not because they don't know, it's because they're suppressing that truth, is what it says. So this is a standard not just for kings. This is a standard for every human. So, okay, okay. That still feels a little theoretical, <laughs> right? Because it's, well, there are evil kings and there are evil, you know, who restrains them? Well, Jesus does that. How does he do that? He does that from heaven. He's, he's, he's doing it through providence. He's doing it through circumstance. He's doing it through uh, conscience. He's doing it through a lot of ways. But what do we do? Okay, that's, that's Christ. What do we do? So let me ask the question. How do we as citizens respond to straying governments to influence them towards the commandments of Christ? Okay, how do we? How do we? What is our relationship to the government? How do we do that when, when, when the government's getting out of its lane, when the government's being unrighteous, when the government's being unruly? Let me first, before we answer this question, let me first say, none of what Romans 13 goes out the window. Let's be clear about that. We still owe the government taxes and respect and honor. We should never seek to, um, to do things in a way that would... Yeah, dishonor God's good design, but we acknowledge corruption, greed, sin, distortion. We do, no matter what we do, we do it in a way that still keeps intact God's design for us to obey submissively. Let me read to us maybe a scripture that you, maybe you haven't put uh, together as uh, having a connection to how we interact with government. How about the Great Command or the Great Commission? Let's read this again through the eyes of government. I mean this. Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Let's read this. Jesus came, this is after he's resurrected. He completed the work on the cross. He's now showing up in glory, resurrected body. And what does he say? All authority in heaven and on earth, some parts of it, has been given to me. That's not how it goes. Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth now. He is king now. And it's from his kingly station of authority that he gives his commands. And what does he say? Go, therefore, 
and make disciples of all nations, all the peoples. Just like we saw in in Psalm chapter 2, the nations rage, the peoples, the pagan peoples. Go make disciples. What does it mean to make disciples? It means to train them, to teach them. It says, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, which means enter into the kingdom of Christ, which is different than the kingdom of this world. But how do we do that? We, we, we go to them, we preach to them, Christ is king. Do you know that that's part of the Great Commission, is going to these people groups and saying, Christ is king, Christ is king, follow Christ, obey Christ. Do we say that to just people who listen? Just people who follow? Or do we say that to literally everyone? We say that to everyone. Whether you're a lowly state or whether you're a king. We preach the same gospel to everyone, everywhere. Christ is king. Go disciple the nations. Go train the nations. And what what do you do? You train them just about the things that matter to their life. No, that's not what it says. It says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Tota scriptura. Go teach them every single part of the scriptures. Just the ones that believe or all the nations. Now, now the ones that believe will get baptized. And that's where they come into the church. All right? So we're not saying that we are sort of, that we're, we're discipling the nations in the same way. But we do disciple the nations. We disciple people who never come to faith. We disciple them by calling them to Christ, by giving them opportunity and clarity and, and, and saying, Christ is king. Follow him. Forgiveness is available. He did it for sinners. That's for every single person in every single part of life. All of Christ for all of life, using all the Bible all the time. You see this? Baked into the cake of the Great Commission is speaking to kings about Christ. May we not lose that. That's there. It's in there. And Jesus is with us when we do that. It's actually fantastic. So let me say, what should our response be? Pray for me. I want to try to get through this. (laughs) Here we go. What, What should we do? Well, we should, let's interact with the government. There's a There's a few responses here. Let's let's start with a a quicker one, a a personal response. We're to pray. We are to pray for the government, right? We were told that. First of all, I urge that supplications and prayers and and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people. For who are are those all people? For kings and for those in high authorities. So we're to pray for them, and that's a personal response. But what do we do when, is that all we do? No, we we actually now move it... There are times where we move it past the personal response into a more public response. How do we do that? Remember, tota scriptura, we need to look at a lot of different scriptures here to see how it was done. So here's here's maybe a first public step. When the, the government needs restraining... When the government needs to know that Christ is king, when the government needs to know what the, the law of God is, when the government is stepping out of their lane, when the government is not applying, doing things they should, here's, here's a response we can have that's more public. We, we respectfully appeal to the government. We respectfully appeal to the government. Look at how Moses does this before Pharaoh. Exodus 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, and they, they, that they may hold a feast, he explains why, that they may hold a feast in the wilderness, for, to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, look at his heart, who is this Lord that I shall obey his voice and let Israel go? Oh, so he is obviously showing his colors here. And it said, and then they said, verse three, or he says, I will not let Israel go. Verse three, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Look at how Moses appeals to Pharaoh respectfully. Please let us go. We want to worship our God. He says, who are you and your God? Why should I listen to him? Please let us go. God, God has called us to do this. Please let us go. Which, by the way, I think we, we as a church have done this step. We have appealed to the government respectfully for us to be able to meet indoors and for us to be able to meet in the way that we've done this. Uh, you know, there is, so let's make this clear. 
California governor has his mandates that he's put out. There's lots of lawsuits against the government right now, against Gavin Newsom, that he has overstepped his reach uh, in, in, in the people, like literally saying you can't sing in your home or you have to be outside and how many people are, are how you meet together in your holidays. There's overstepping here. Um, and so what we have done is we've gone to other legitimate lesser governments and said, are you going to enforce this? We want to meet. Please let us meet because we think we can do this. And, the, and here's what the government told us. Here's what city of Whittier told us. Or here's what, you know, the sheriff or, or I'm sorry, the chief of police and the mayor told us. Be safe. Be smart. Do what you got to do. Do you know what that means? They were acting within the, the, the design of the government. They encouraged us to do good. But they didn't punish us for doing anything that's evil because we're not doing anything that's evil. We're n it's not evil to meet for worship. It's not evil to give a non-member of your family a hug. It's not evil to be within a foot of a person who's not in your family, not according to God. In fact, he says, greet one another with a, with a holy kiss. It's not evil to sing psalms, hymns, hymns and spiritual songs. It's not evil to gather indoors. No. So what do we go? We went to a, a, a righteous government and said, we must we will follow the Lord. And the government said, be safe, be smart, follow. And so we're not looking to cause trouble. So we're in this stage right now, by the way. And by the way, I don't know if any of you have heard, a church up the street, uh, uh, Calvary Chapel, uh, the health department showed up last week and fined them $500 for their meeting. This is in the city of Whittier now. This is in our town, one minute drive away. This is not theoretical. So it's important that we talk about these things because we're living with this right now. But what do we do? We appeal to the government. Pharaoh, look at Daniel before, uh, before the king, uh, Daniel chapter one. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. He was told to eat certain foods or with the wine that he had drunk. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. He said, please don't let me do this. I don't, I don't want to do this. And the God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief in, in, of the eunuchs. This is great. So there's another example. Look at Paul. That's Old Testament. Let's look at New Testament. Paul before Agrippa, Acts chapter 26. So Agrippa said to Paul, you, uh, you have permission to speak for yourself, Right? So he goes to in front of Agrippa, and if you know the story it's been through, he's been through a lot in terms of in front of this ruler and this ruler and this ruler. Now he's to Agrippa. He appealed to Caesar. Now he's in Agrippa. And Paul stretched out his hand, made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I make, uh, I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg that you listen to me patiently. Look at how Paul respectfully appeals to the government here. And so that's our first option of how we can do this. And, and I sh we should do this carefully. We should do this respectfully. We should not immediately do this. If there's something we can continue to submit to, let's do that. But there are times where it's appropriate to push back, but we should do it in a godly manner and to appeal respectfully. Let's look at the second point. It's that we are to carefully... When it escalates, okay, what if, what if you do that and, and it still stays the same? There's still unrighteousness. There's still things that are out of, out of whack. We should carefully then confront the government. Ratchets up a little bit. There's confrontation of the government doing wrong. This is where you get lawsuits. This is where you say, foul, can't do that against the law. You're breaking their own laws. Look, look, look at this. Uh, people, I love this, the people against Saul, in Old Testament, Saul, can I make, Saul made a stupid law. He made a stupid law that hurt the people. And, 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 and here's what happens. 1 Samuel 14. And when the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day, Saul had laid an oath on the people. Notice this, it's like heavy. He like put it on top of them and made them, made them obey it, right? And this is what he said. Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people had tasted food. They're in a war. They need sustenance. They need food. And he says, nobody's going to eat until we win. Stupid law. And here's what happens. So then none of the people ate. 
Now, when all the people came to the forest, behold, there was honey on the ground. And when the people entered the forest, behold, the honey was dropping, but no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. People are scared of Saul, the king. They're like, I'm not going to eat, even though I really want that honey. Delicious. Organic. All right, we'll see. So what happens? Verse 27. But Jonathan, Saul's son, had not heard of his father's dumb charge, to the people with the oath. So he put to the tip like he should. He's hungry. It's not wrong to eat when you're hungry. It's a stupid law. And what's he say? He, he dips his hand into his mouth and his eyes became bright. He's like, da 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 sugar rush, yeah. Let's do this. Let's go get these guys. His eyes become bright, but then look what happens. Verse 28, then the people said to him, your father strictly charged the people with an oath saying, curse be the man who eats the food this day. And the people who, and the people were faint. They're like, oh no, you just broke the law. Then Jonathan said, Jonathan said look at this, my father has troubled the land. This was dumb. But father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have become bright because I have tasted a little of this honey. He's like, everybody should be eating this honey. This is good to be eating this honey. So now look at how, it, look at how uh, it keeps going. Verse 30. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies that they found. Now the defeat among the Philistines has not been great. It could have been way better. This is dumb ruling. So now he gets confronted, Jonathan, by his father. And Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you've done. And Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey. He took responsibility. He didn't hide. He didn't lie. He said, I tasted the honey, the tip of my staff that was in my hand. And look what he says. Here I am. Here I am. I will die. Interesting that he goes, all right, if I broke the law, it's a dumb law. Shouldn't have made that. But I'm willing to submit to the circumstances or to the consequences of it. That's an important rule here. It's that if you defy, if you, that you have to be willing to take the consequences and look what it says, verse 44. Saul said to him, God, do so to me and, and more also. You shall surely die, Jonathan. He's going to kill his own son for a stupid law. We see this? Now, here's what happens next. Verse 45. Then the people said to Saul. The people said to Saul. Shall Jonathan die? Who has worked this great salvation in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people ransomed Jonathan that he did not die. There are times where you go to the government for making stupid laws and saying, you can't do that. That's stupid. That's hurting us. You can't do that. That's literally bringing death when, when he's like one of our best guys. What are you doing? Submit. Submit to the government. Submit to the government. Submit to the government. Not in absolutely every single thing, every time. There are times when life or death is at stake and literally you're, you are up against the enemies. Now, this is important. This is in the Bible, okay? There's a category. Confront the king. Say, no, you can't do that. Look at John the Baptist in Herod. John the Baptist, for it, uh, Mark 6, for it was Herod who sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his, bro his brother Philip's wife, because, uh, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. What did John the Baptist do? Hey, Herod, you can't have your brother's wife like that against the law. What is John the Baptist doing? Confronting the king about his unlawfulness. You see this? Example after example after example. This is not comprehensive, always obey the government. This is, there are times when we need to stand up for the sake of truth and righteousness and life so that the kings can't rule unrighteously. Now notice, John the Baptist got beheaded for that. John the Baptist got beheaded. Many of us don't want to do this because we don't want to go through the consequences. But this is why God, Christ being king is so important. Because if we are following Christ, you can take my life and I win. It's not about me preserving my life on earth. It's about me glorifying God while I'm on earth. So we must not fear kings for king's sake. We must fear kings for God's sake and seek to help the king rule righteously. Now let's look at this last one. Last one. 
We don't, we, we have, we can respond by respectfully appealing to the government, by carefully confronting the government, and, and, and when worse comes to worse, it can get to this point, we obey God and we defy the government. You know, it's like enough's enough. We obey God and we defy the government. Now this has, let me, let me say it this way. Here's when we do this. You don't do this whenever you want. It has to get to that point. But look what it says. We, we submit, we cannot, we must not submit to authorities who command what God forbids, meaning the government's telling us we have to do something that God says, nope, and we, or forbids what God commands. When the government says, you can't do that, but God says we must. Like sing, like gather. This is how that works. Look at the Hebrew midwives in Exodus chapter one. Now there rose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to the people, behold, the people of Israel are too many, too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them and let, lest they multiply and the war breaks out and they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, I shall set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. And so the king of Egypt, verse 15, said to the Hebrew midwives, one whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew woman, and see them on the, the birth stool. If it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, you sh he, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. You see that? Feared God, but let the male children live. Verse 18. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said, Why have you done this? And let the, ch the male children live. And the midwives said to, to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women and they are vigorous and give birth before the, the midwife comes to them. Let me tell you why I'm reading this. Because many people struggle with this particular part of the story because it seems like uh, they're lying. Here's what I think is going on that I want to expose this to. The Bible gives examples of God's people being shrewd being wise with the government in order to protect life, in order to, to, to not go against what God commands. So look what it says. They said, oh, it was, they just have them so quick, I couldn't get, no, they chose not to. They chose not to, right? And look what it says, verse 20, so God dealt well with the midwives. He dealt well with these midwives who followed God's law and not the bad king's law and even in a way that was wise and shrewd and crafty. Now this doesn't mean that we should be looking to lie. What this means is we should be looking to preserve life and to preserve God's honor and to preserve truth. So this is a big topic. But I wanted to show you it's in the Bible and it's not the only time. Let me show you the next story, Rahab. Rahab does a similar thing, Joshua chapter 2. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly to, from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, this is the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men whom, uh, who have come to you, who have entered your house. That's an order. The king said this. An uh, order, and for they... For they have come to search out the land. Verse 4, but the women had taken the two men and hidden them. They were shrewd. They were crafty. And he said, true, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were there from. And when the gates was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. And I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, and you will overtake them. Look what Rahab does. She goes, I don't know what happened. There they go. Go over there. Go get them. Meanwhile, they're in the rafters. They're in the rafters. Look what it says, verse six. But she had brought them up into the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that, he had got, that she had laid in order of the roof. And I wanna tell you, like people, people really struggle with this tension morally. But I wanna tell you, the New Testament talks about this passage positively. Did you know that? New Testament, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, she makes the hall of faith. Rahab, Gentile. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. She was obedient. To who? Not to the king. To God. She was obedient to God. 
Look at James chapter 2. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? It's a positive example. For as for the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. There are some times, in fact, I, I want to let you know, I'm probably only going to give you maybe, you know, half of the examples that I, that I personally found. There are so many examples in all parts of all the scriptures. First five books, in Joshua, in the historical books, in the wisdom literature, it's in the prophecies, it's in the prophetic books, it's in the New Testament, it's in the epistles, it's in, it's in Revelation, it's literally in every part of the Bible. This, this category of people defying the government because they have to obey God rather than men. It's here, Obadiah, Kings 1. You know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that. Obadiah does this, verse, verse three. Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a 100 prophets, hid them by 50s in a cave. Said, oh, she wants to kill all these prophets? Nope, not gonna let you. Gonna defy Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No, king, we will not bow down. So it's not, some people may go, oh, it's only when you're trying to save a life. It's only, this is when you do that, only when it's life or death situations. No, that's not true. Because, because uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were commanded to do false worship. It's not just life and death. It's in, in categories of things like worship. When we are told to worship a certain way that's not God's way, we do not follow that. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, was furious at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought. So they brought them, these men, before him, and he answered them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you did not serve my gods or worship the golden idol that I have set up? And they answered him, saying, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God, will, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known, O king, they're still being <laughs> respectful, that... We will not serve your gods or worship your golden image that you've set up. It's not just life or death. It's worship too. You see this? This is everywhere. Daniel is told not to pray to the one God. And what does he do? He prays to the one God. So this is when you're commanded that you, you must do something wrong or when you're forbidden from doing something you must do. Uh, Daniel 6, Peter and John. And I'll end with these Acts examples. Peter and John. They commanded them in, in Acts 4 to leave the council and they conferred with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For there's a notable sign that they've performed through the evidence of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. See, they're conspiring, they're plotting in, in order that they may spread no further the people. Let us warn them and speak not to say anyone. So they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach in the name, at all in the name of Jesus, whether Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must be judged. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. First, uh, chapter 5. And saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here, they filled, we have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And so, if you even look at that one passage, when they get beaten and thrown into prison, do you know what they do while they're, while they're being beaten and thrown into prison? They sing hymns. In prison, and they count it a joy to be suffer for the name of Christ. So here's something I want to put before us. I don't think I'll I'll confess I have not had a robust enough understanding of what the Bible teaches about how we should interact with government because frankly we've had pretty good freedoms here that we've never really had to deal with this sort of a thing. And I'm not saying that our particular situation is the worst or that, you know, what I'm saying is I just didn't have the right categories and I wasn't aware of the Bible enough. There are so many more scriptures that I did not put before you. I want to encourage you. God is king, Christ is king, and he will give us wisdom on how we should live our lives. But the Bible is what leads our lives. And we are seeking to obey. We are seeking to subject ourselves to the authorities. But the authorities do not run our lives. 
They, they, they're, they're servants of God, and when they don't act like servants of God, we should appeal to them respectfully. Sometimes we need to confront them with lawsuits, and there's lots of lawsuits that are happening right now. And then there are other times where we just say, sorry, no, we're doing it God's way. So I want to encourage us. We are not rebellious people when we obey God. We are not rebellious people when we obey God. But may we not let the rebellion that is often in our hearts get out of whack. Like, this is not about running ahead and saying, where can I disobey? This is not about that. This is saying, where can I obey God? This is all about obedience to God, the whole thing. The whole thing. So I want to encourage us. We may get fines. I want to, I want to encourage you. We may get fines. And may we sing hymns and say, praise the Lord that God gives us the ability to suffer for his name. Now, are we looking to get fines? Are we, are we, are we being, you know, boisterous? And are, we, are we putting our thumb in the government's eye? No, we're actually trying to be discreet. Kind of like Rahab and kind of like we're trying to be wise and shrewd. We're not bringing a bunch of attention to ourselves because we're trying to be peaceable here and worship here. We just want to worship our God. That's what we want to do. So may we do that with humble humble grace, and just be ready to suffer for, for the name of Christ. Amen? Let me pray. Jesus, this is a very big and complex issue, and you know all of it. And so, Lord, we don't know all of it. So I, I confess, Lord, and I thank you for your scriptures. I thank you that it's the, the only and final authority, and I thank you that you've given us all the scriptures to mine, Lord. There's so many more that I just didn't even touch on. Lord, you have so much to say about this. So, Lord, I pray that you'd encourage us not towards rebellious spirits, but towards obedient spirits. I pray that you'd encourage us towards seeking the, your kingdom first and your righteousness first. I pray that we'd seek to preach your name to everyone, everywhere, all the time. Lord, disciple non-Christians towards righteousness, even if they never come to faith. Lord, may we be a light in this world and preserve it's, more, it's moral compass by, by displaying the truth of your word. We thank you, Jesus, for this role and task. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.